Hello all of you beautiful people, Jules here for WhatCulture.com and I just gotta say, even though we as a viewing audience absolutely love seeing superheroes do battle with big bads all across the globe and beyond, that doesn't always mean that what we're witnessing is super smart. And I'm not talking about the films themselves, but actually decisions made by the main characters. So let's take a look at some rather questionable decisions. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com and these are the 10 dumbest decisions in superhero movie history. Number 10. Killmonger doesn't confirm T'Challa's death. Black Panther. For Black Panther's first two acts, practically everything goes right for the villainous Eric Killmonger. He insinuates his way into Wakanda by offering up the bodies of Ulysses Claw, who he himself killed, before revealing his true identity as T'Challa's cousin and then challenging him to a fight for the throne. Killmonger then kills T'Challa's confidant, Zuri, and easily defeats T'Challa in the ensuing fight. But rather than snap his neck or stab him to death, he makes the conscious and rather idiotic decision to throw him off the edge of a waterfall instead. Now, I don't know if he's played any of the Tekken games, but that doesn't tend to work. And that was a bloody volcano. Sure, you could argue that T'Challa's prospects of survival were incredibly slim, but is it really expecting too much of a guy called Killmonger, who marks his own body to count his confirmed kills, no less, to actually confirm the damn kill? As a result, the Black Panther is able to rest up and return for a rematch at the end of the movie, leading to Killmonger's demise, all because he made the battle decision to toss his cousin overboard rather than kill him in front of everyone. Number 9. The heroes get wasted and visit Planet Zero. Fantastic Four. Josh Trank's Fantastic Four is a head-smackingly inane movie from start to finish, but there's one character decision in the film that's especially brain-dead, and that's the means through which the titular quartet gains their superpowers. After being denied authorization to use their quantum gate to explore the parallel dimension known as Planet Zero, the team commiserates by, um, well, getting blind drunk and then deciding that they're gonna go there anyway. Read Johnny, Ben, and Victor Von Doom suit up and teleport to Planet Zero, and as you can imagine, Heading to a volatile, uncharted new world where you're three sheets to the wind is not a good idea. Victor ends up trapped on the planet while the others only barely escape, but the quantum gate explodes, permanently changing the hero's physiology and sending a wave of radiation back through the gate, which Sue also comes into contact with. You can almost sense what Trank was going for here. His original version of the Fantastic Four was much more of a horror film and was actually inspired by David Cronenberg's sci-fi classic The Fly, but given that the studio absolutely destroyed Trank's vision, the end result was basically a more down-the-line superhero origin story, meaning that the heroes were born through alcoholic stupidity and was therefore very unsatisfying and tonally bizarre for the audience. Number 8. Two-Face basically gets himself killed. Batman Forever. Joel Schumacher's divisive Batman Forever doesn't have a particularly firm grasp on character logic, though that still doesn't excuse the thigh-slappingly hilarious stupidity of Two-Face during his final showdown with Batman. Harvey Dent is holding Batman, Robin, and Dr. Chase Meridian at gunpoint when the Cape Crusader reminds him that he hasn't flipped his customary coin yet. Dent duly complies, but while his coin is in the air, Batman throws a handful of additional coins at him, causing him to lose his footing as he desperately reaches for his original coin and then falls to his death. Even accepting the cartoonish mental instability of this version of Two-Face, it was extremely groan-worthy as an end for this character, hoisted with his own petard in the most embarrassingly simple way possible. And if you want to get technical about it, Batman basically just murdered a guy, right? He knew exactly what would happen by throwing these coins at him, so um, yeah, no one's a winner here. Number 7. Peter gives Edith to Mysterio, Spider-Man Far From Home. Now, Peter Parker gets a lot of justifiable slack for being a young, naive kid, but even so, his decision to give Tony Stark's Edith technology to Quentin Beck, aka Mysterio, shortly after meeting him was, um, well, just baffling. The film makes a decent effort to depict Beck as a suave and charming, cool uncle figure for Peter, and Peter's desire to put superhero shenanigans on the back burner for a while is palpable, but, um, maybe this should have been run by Nick Fury, Maria Hill, or anybody else first? Obviously, the post credit scene reveals that Fury and Hill were being impersonated by the scrolls and therefore their lack of typical wisdom is kind of explained, but even so, it didn't require a pre-natural level of intelligence to appreciate that giving such power to a newbie on the scene was a tad risky. As a result, Mysterio is able to launch his revenge crusade against Tony Stark's legacy and very nearly succeeded, until Spidey defeats him and Mysterio ends up killed by his own tech. Number 6. Everyone forgives Magneto's murderous rampage, X-Men Apocalypse. 
apocalypse. To say that the X-Men series has taken a charitably sympathetic view of Magneto would be rather an understatement. The guy has done more face heel turns than the bloody Big Show, and yet the X-Men, especially Charles Xavier, still welcome him back to the fold with open arms every bloody time. This reached its moronic apex at the end of X-Men Apocalypse, where after Magneto had literally slaughtered hundreds of millions of people while in league with Apocalypse, Xavier kindly accepted him once again, even referring to him as an old friend. Even even if you accept that Magneto is Xavier's emotional blind spot, does it really make sense for anyone to forgive somebody when they cause that much suffering, especially when it damages Xavier's own efforts for human mutant harmony? But then again, granted, Professor X has become increasingly daft in the last few X-Men films, bizarrely renaming his school after Jean Grey rather than Mystique is a very good example of that, but the fact that he and other superheroes didn't bat an eye at Magneto's wanton slaughter was monumentally dumb. Number 5. Superman kisses Lois to erase her memory. Superman 2. Well, um, that, that, that's just not cool. <laughs> I, I've got nothing else to say about that other than, ooh, gross, Superman, stop it. And I'm not trying to play devil's advocate here, but I'm just saying, if you wanted to keep your secret identity safe and you were going to use this roofy smooch style thing anyway, then why not do it the second that she found out? N not later on in the movie. No, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. It's just gross. Number four, Doc Ock throws a car at Peter without knowing he's Spider-Man. Spider-Man 2. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2 remains one of the greatest superhero movies ever made. But there is one moment that proves a touch baffling when re-watching this. Despite Doc Ock making a deal with Harry Osborn to find Spider-Man using Peter Parker, the supervillain makes a pretty damn active effort to murder the hell out of Peter. The film's iconic cafe scene sees Doc Ock throw a car through the window at Peter and Mary Jane, and were it not for Peter actually being Spider-Man, which is unbeknownst to his attacker, they both would have been killed by the car. Now, some fans have argued that Doc Ock threw the car in the hope that Spider-Man would spring into action and save his friend, but the far more plausible explanation is simply that Octavius's brain was simply being impacted by the the tentacles forcing him to carry out an act that was both needlessly aggressive and, um, well, totally counter to logic. Even though Octavius has a solid excuse for behaving erratically, there's no denying that actively trying to kill the person that you're supposed to be capturing and interrogating is very dumb. Number 3. Iron Man invites the Mandarin to destroy his house. Iron Man 3. Tony Stark may have had the ultimate heroic sacrifice in Avengers Endgame, but he hasn't always been the most shrewd decision maker, as evidenced by him calling out the Mandarin on national TV and social media, giving out his home address and saying that he also leaves the door unlocked. While there are some mitigating circumstances here, namely the combination of Happy Hogan almost being killed by the Mandarin, crushing anxiety, and the press riling Tony up, Tony was really asking for trouble here, and he absolutely got it. The Mandarin ends up responding with a missile barrage that destroys Tony's lush Malibu home and very nearly kills another of his favorite people, Pepper Potts. Now, Tony giving out his address isn't that big of a deal because anyone with a computer could probably find it anyway, but challenging an extremely well-equipped terrorist to a battle while failing to take suitable provisions to protect your home and your loved ones? Well, that is just stupid. Number 2. Jonathan Kent sacrifices himself for no reason, and Clark lets it happen. Man of Steel Zack Snyder's divisive Superman origin story was controversial for many reasons, least not its depiction of Jonathan Kent, who stridently feels that Clark should keep his identity a secret no matter the human cost. This comes to a head when Jonathan ends up being caught in a tornado, and just as Clark goes to rescue him, he raises his hand, insisting that Clark not risk revealing himself by rescuing his father. Of course, this this results in Jonathan's death. Now, the idea on paper isn't awful by any means, but the execution is laughable because it doesn't make any sense. Also, could maybe Kevin Costner have tried to look a little bit worried about his own demise? No, fair enough. No one gives a toss in this film about dying. If you've watched some of the scenes, seriously, everyone's just like, oh, time to die, is it? Oh, brew, brew, nice. Clark could have saved Jonathan in a nanosecond while all the bystanders were distracted with, you know, the tornado. And even if you consider that Clark wasn't in full control of his powers yet, the logic still doesn't track that anyone in his position, with his abilities, would just let their father die. Snyder clearly wanted to up the moral ambiguity of Jonathan's death by veering away from the traditional heart attack scenario, and while it is an interesting concept, the clunky writing and unintentionally comic direction make father and son look like a pair of idiots. And number one, Diana and Steve recruit a PTSD-riddled alcoholic, Wonder Woman. 
In Wonder Woman, Diana and Steve end up forming a ragtag team of down-and-out soldiers to help fight their battle, including a PTSD-afflicted alcoholic marksman known as Charlie. Now, Charlie's a perfectly charming character, and his inclusion in the movie is well worth it for that line alone, but who will sing to us, Charlie? Though, from a tactical perspective, thinking that you can rely on a thoroughly rattled, boozy soldier who'd rather be anywhere else is hilariously daft. Taking the poor guy away from his pint and chucking him back into the battlefield isn't just dumb, it's actually insensitive. And though it's admirable that the film doesn't give Charlie some cliched redemption arc, and that it commends his value beyond his designation as a soldier, he's also just about the last person that you'd want watching your back. But um, bless him, but no. And there we go, my friends. Those were the 10 dumbest decisions in superhero movie history. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. If you want to chat to me further, you can do so over on Twitter, at RetroJ with a zero, or you can swing by Live and Let's Dice as my personal gaming channel, where I stream every single Wednesday and Sunday. But before I go, you superhero, let me boost up your morale a little bit by telling you that you deserve love, happiness, and success, you big, big ledge. Do not let anyone or anything else tell you otherwise, okay? Go out there and absolutely smash it, because there is only one of you, and you, as I've just said, are an absolute bloody ledge. Big love from me to you. As always, I've been Jules, you have been awesome, never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.